All right. Well, it's always a, a privilege and an honor to be able to uh, share the Word of God and to spend time in fellowship with you during our worship service. Uh, I would like to add uh, a prayer at this moment as well. Father, uh, we dedicate our hearts to you once more. I dedicate this moment, Lord. I pray that you would anoint my lips, that it would be your voice heard. I pray that you would anoint the ears of those here, that it would be your word that is heard. Anoint our hearts, Lord, that your spirit would be welcome in our thoughts and in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I am going to share a series of, of messages uh, moving forward, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more as we get into the message, but um, all along the idea of, of a, a deeper understanding of who God is. Anyone, has anyone ever said to you, who do you think you are? It's rarely said in a positive way, right? It, it's, it's usually quite negative. Who do you think you are? And it's it's a way of saying you're out of line, you're out of place. You don't seem to understand uh, where you're at. Uh, this is a little bit of the inverse of that, of, of inviting us to a deeper understanding of who we think Jesus is. Who do we think he is? Uh, and how much more can we learn about him and appreciate from that journey and that study? So um, I have to admit, I, I did kind of forget that it was Children's Church Week. So the quiz is more oriented towards young people, but I did change it to teen trivia, and I know how much our young people love quizzes and tests. They just can't get enough of it. But um, I am going to go ahead and begin with my normal uh, little interactive period uh, of uh, teen trivia here since our children are mostly engaged with Children's Church, but it's open to all young people here. I usually have someone help out with mics. So if I could get a couple of volunteers, usually I've got Toby and Jaden to do this, but um, they're at Children's Church. George, thank you so much. Appreciate you helping in, John. Thank you. Most of our young people are over here. I'm going to be looking a little bit more towards you uh, uh, as we begin our investigation into this topic, but I know there's young people elsewhere. Uh, just a little bit of trivia. Animals that are types of Christ that we, we read about in the Bible. These aren't hard young people. They are fairly common, but I think it's a good way to get us in the uh, thinking mode of who do we think Jesus is. So let's see if you know any of these. Behold the what of God? The elephant of God? The giraffe of God? Madden, good to have you. The lamb of God. The lamb of God is what we're looking for here, right? And by the way, the lamb obviously was the most uh, common or the most significant of all the uh, sacrificial animals, but all of the sacrificial animals are a symbol of Christ. The bulls, the goats, the grown lambs, the, the rams, uh, the birds, all of them were sacrificed uh, because they typified Christ in some way. And I also want to say every animal was made by God, and in some way every animal uh, we can learn about God, can't we? Every animal we study, uh, we can learn about God. And so, but these are some of the more common ones in the Bible. Behold the Lamb of God. Thank you, Madden. The second one, this animal of the tribe of Judah. This is another way that Jesus is referred to. What animal are we talking about here? The something of the tribe of Judah. Is that Adon? Lion. The lion. Thank you, Adon. He's the, so he's both, yeah. Oh, you got a round of applause. That's awesome. So he's, he's both of these, right? He's the lamb. He's the lion. Uh, he can be everything in between. All right, let's go to the next one. As This was the one you might not think of. As Moses lifted up the what, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up. What animal is Jesus compared to in this? What animal was lifted up on the pole or the stick? All right, I see you, Nico. Go right there to Nico. As Moses lifted up the snake, Wrong. serpent, serpent. <laughs> yes, that's right. I would have accepted snake for partial credit, of course. But yes, as Moses left. So it's very interesting that Jesus, part of his sacrificial work, part of being the lamb is he had to take on the sins of the serpent. So just as the serpent led humanity into sin, 
A serpent had to pay the price for sin, so Jesus symbolically became the serpent on the stake. And if you look to Jesus, then you would be healed. All right, uh, this one, yeah, again, uh, we'll see if you know. I wanted to gather your children as a what? Jesus looking at the Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, she who stones the prophets and those who are sent to you. How often I wanted to gather your children as a what? Young people, what do you think? What animal did Jesus refer to himself as like in this passage? As, an, as a zebra? <laughs> As a leopard, as a gorilla. <laughs> oh, Orion, we'd love, you. yeah. I want to say a hen. As a hen. Now, you, you, you sound a little hesitant. <laughs> Is that your final answer? Okay. Yeah, the most common translation you'll, you'll hear is a hen. Um, and it'll say even gathering their chickens under them. Um, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with God comparing himself to a chicken. Okay, chickens can be very nurturing, very mothering. And even in the family of chickens like pheasant and quail, any of you seen the quail out uh, kind of shepherding their little babies around? It's very cute to see the, the quail out there. They're in the same family as chickens and things like that, or pheasant that, that we'll cover there. However, I want to share with you, this word doesn't have to mean chicken. It also can be translated eagle. And if you think about the Old Testament, uh, application of God comparing himself to a bird. It's more often an eagle as the bird, the, the Deuteronomy says, as the eagle stirs up its nest and covers its young, he lifts up his children on his wings and shelters them with his pinions. He, he, he more often compares the, uh, the sustaining power of God when it's a bird to an eagle. So I don't know about you. I just, I like, it's, it's a little more no, ennobling to me to see God as an eagle uh, rather than as a chicken. Uh, but again, chickens have their place, um, and, and that's fine. Uh, but even one of the four living creatures in Revelation was an eagle. So, um, But if you want to see God as a chicken, that's okay. That's all right. He wants to gather his children under his wings as many birds do. Okay, last one. The spirit like this descended upon him. Um, is it Landon? Yeah, I was getting there. I was almost there. Landon, thank you very much. A dove? Spirit like a dove. Aren't these intelligent young people we have in the church today? That is awesome. Oh, did Elias want an answer too? Oh, I want to hear Elias answer too. Well, I, we want to hear it through the microphone, buddy. Dove. He said dove. That's awesome. So glad. Vitor, did you help him with that? No. Oh, maybe a little bit. Thank you, guys. That, that's all of them. Spirit like a dove descended on him. And again, all of these uh, are, are analogies and symbols that God uses. There's something instructive about any of them. But uh, of course, as we study nature, we see the fingerprints and the character of God all over the place. But it's fun uh, when we uh, appreciate it through the life of animals. Something's happened to my slides. So we're just going to go with it, though. I'm starting a new series, um, and we're going to be going through the Gospel of John. Maybe not the entire gospel, chapter by chapter, story by story, but for the next several weeks, um, we're going to be journeying through the early chapters, especially of John. We'll be in John chapter 1 today. Next week, we'll be in John chapter 2. Uh, the third Sabbath of the month, we're actually having Pathfinder Sabbath here. They're going to do investiture with us um, here at Scottsdale Thunderbird. We're doing a joint program right now with uh, Paradise Valley, um, but they had induction at their church, so we're doing investiture at ours. So we're looking forward to that Sabbath. The last Sabbath of the month is graduation Sabbath for TAA, so they will be having a program over at the gymnasium, but we'll still be having worship here as well, and so we'll continue our journey through John um, at the end of the month, and then uh, beyond, we'll see where we go from there. But if we're going to spend time in John, I wanted to spend just a little bit of uh, time introducing us to some of the realities of John that will be helpful um, when we are, are, are studying together. Um, as the first thing here says, first, John is different than the other Gospels. Okay? The other Gospels are called the synoptic Gospels, which just means similar vision, optics, similar look. Okay? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and by the way, this isn't to elevate one Gospel over another and say this one's more important, this one's more holy, or anything like that. They're just different. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a similar pattern, similar story. They tell the similar details, similar facts, all from a slightly different perspective that helps us appreciate Jesus. Um, in a different light. But John is different. 
He does not have the same intentionality of how he shares the stories of, of Christ. He has very specific stories and a desire of sharing about Jesus that, that makes his gospel unique. Um, when John writes his gospel, it's generally agreed that it was the last of the gospels written. He likely knew of at least Matthew and Mark and maybe Luke all, as well when he wrote his gospel. He knew those letters were already there and he intentionally wants to add something. Okay, John is not just trying to re uh, go through the story. He is intentionally trying to add something. We know that he's writing to Greek people and to probably people who are not as familiar with Judaism and Hebrew and, and that type of thing. And, and we'll see that along the way. And it's also generally agreed that when John wrote his gospel, he's writing it to people who already believe. He is not trying to convince people to believe in Christ. All right? He's doing something different, okay? And that gets to the next line here. John is, uh, he is not informing us of information about Jesus Christ. The tone and the intentionality of his gospel is confrontational. He is, con and not to be argumentative or debate, not that type of confront, but he is really trying to confront the reader with a deeper understanding of Christ. He is sharing something of a serious nature, something that is, is, is directly uh, significant to the life of the believer. And as he writes his gospel, as he's writing, again, probably with believers already in mind, he really is confronting you with Jesus. He's not just saying, here, I'd like you to think about this. Here's some good information. It's more of a tone of, I am telling you something significant. Please take it serious. Do you, you understand the difference? between informing and confronting. So his tone is a little bit more serious, although he's very funny at times. He contradicts himself at times in some of uh, his, not his theology or things like that, but just in his, his way of telling things. Um, he's more emotional than some of the other gospel writers um, in how he shares. Um, and so it's a unique gospel. It's wonderful. The other ones have their wonderful features as well, but it's just good to be aware of these things as we go through the book of John. Um, John is more interested in the truth than the other gospel writers. And again, not to say Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not believe in the truth and teach the truth and want believers to believe in the truth and all that, but their, their use of the word truth and their focus on truth is just different. Virtually all the gospel verses that you can think of that have the word truth in them come from the gospel of John. Out of the 30 or so times that the word truth is found in the Gospels, about 22 of those are found just in John, all right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are giving you facts. They're giving you prophecy. They're giving you the reality. They're giving you the chronology. They're giving you all those things which are the truth. But again, John wants to confront us with the truth. So John tells us that Jesus was filled with grace and truth. John tells us that we should worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. It's in John that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus, it's, it's in John uh, when, when Jesus says, uh, 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 sanctify them with the word, sanctify them with the truth. Okay, and it's in John that Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Okay, almost all of the verses that you think of in the context of the gospels that, that emphasize truth, you're going to find in John. So he seems to be more focused on confronting us with some deeper reality of who the truth, of what the truth is, is found in Jesus Christ. But this last one is one that is probably the most, I don't know, summarizing or significant. John's focus throughout his entire gospel, from right at the beginning, clear all the way down to the end, to the final verse that he writes, is he's trying to uh, uh, encourage the reader to understand that Jesus is more. He's more. You may have read about him in Matthew, but he's more. And you're going to get a lot of good things out of Mark, but he's more. And Luke is going to give you a lot of good information, but he's more. Jesus is more. Right from the beginning, the very first verses of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. Matthew traces the lineage of, of Jesus to Abraham. And so for the Hebrew audience, for the Jewish audience, that's very important. Luke 
traces the, uh, the lineage of Jesus all the way back to Adam. And for the Gentile audience, that's great. Oh, so Jesus also comes from all of the nations. But John says, no, Jesus is more. He can trace him all the way back to eternity. He's more than a child of Abraham. He's more than a child of Adam. He comes from the very beginning. Jesus is more. He's more. You, 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 you know that he's love, but he's more. You know that he's grace, but he's more. You know that he's the sacrifice for sin, but he's more. This is the heartbeat of John. This is the desire of John. This is the message of John. Jesus is more. Whoever you think he is, he's more. And there should be a growing reality. The, the, the believer should never come to a place where you're sustained or you think that you are, are, are uh, uh, excuse me, at a, a plateau or you've reached status quo when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. You should never get to the point where you say, I have enough. I've got enough. The gospel of John comes along and says, there's more. There's more. And so that, that's just part of the, the guiding principle when we go through his book to remember he's not just giving you additional details or just sharing his unique perspective. He has a plan led by the Holy Spirit. He has a plan and a purpose in what he is sharing. And that's why John is, is one of the more beautiful books in, in a lot of its tone. Oh, um, did we put this in pro presenter? Ah, that's what happened. That's okay. We can do it. We're going to be fine. All right. We're going to be fine. <laughs> Uh, John chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, John chapter 1, verses 35 to 51. And I'm actually going to back up. I don't want you to see that slide just yet. I want you to listen as we go through the, the Bible story here, and I want you to think about something. John chapter 1, verse 35. So I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Uh, John has already introduced the eternity of Christ and the origins of Christ and, and the baptism of Christ and John the Baptist um, introducing Christ, all those things he's already gone over. I'm jumping ahead to the next day. Jesus has just been baptized. He's still wet behind the ears, all right? He's been living his life for 30 years. Luke is the one that tells us that Jesus was about 30 years old when he got baptized. He's not preached a sermon. He's not done a miracle. He has not uh, invited any followers here. He's been nothing but a carpenter living under the tutelage of his, of his parents up until this point just been baptized. We're going to pick up the story in verse 35. Now, as I read, I'm going to come back to these verses in a minute, uh, but I'm going to read these verses. And as I do, I just want you to listen to all the ways in which Jesus is named, titled, or identified in these verses. And if you're listening carefully, you're going to see a lot of them. Just notice all the different ways. Who do you think he is? Let's see what John is trying to tell us here and who Jesus is, all right? Are you listening? John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. Listen for all the ways in which Jesus is identified, titled, named, all right? Again, the next day, John, this is John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. That was the first one paying attention. Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Two of his disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translates means teacher. Where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found his own brother Simon and said to him, we've found the Messiah which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John, but you shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Now Philip found Nathanael and said of him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said that I saw you under the tree, you believe 
you will see greater things than these. You will see greater things than these. Jesus is more. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, I know I read that through fairly quickly. Um, I assume that you are somewhat familiar with the stories that are, we're reading here in the calling of the first disciples. But did you happen to notice all the different names that were applied to Jesus, all the different titles? We don't even have time to go through them all. In 15, 16 short verses, he gets called many different things, but we're going to spend just a moment looking at some of them. And because my slides aren't advancing, you're just going to see them all here, and that's okay. The first one that we mentioned is he's called the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Now, this is something that is just very interesting to remember and think of. The Gospel of John was not John's only writing in the New Testament. What other books did he write? He wrote Revelation, and he wrote his three epistles. Now, there's a debate among New Testament scholars and those who study the Gospel of John uh, and, and the writings of John about when they were written and uh, the order in which they were written. And most historically, it's been understood or believed that Revelation was his last book. And I don't know about you, but just because it's at the end, I kind of picture John was on the Isle of Patmos. He has this powerful vision. He writes it down. Oh my goodness, what wonderful things. And kind of as he writes the very last verses and come, the spirit and the bride say, come, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. He writes the last word and dies. <laughs> That's kind of how I pictured it. But you know, honestly, we don't know which of these were written first. And there are many, there's a growing uh, group of New Testament scholars who are starting to argue that John may have wrote Revelation before he wrote his gospel. Now, we don't know historical traditions and things like that. However, I want you to think about something just for a second. Uh, Larry Lichtenwalter would be one who argues that uh, John wrote Revelation first. John is given this powerful vision on the Isle of Patmos. And at the center point of that vision is Jesus Christ, right? We know that's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's how the book begins. Jesus is so magnified. Jesus is so glorified when John sees Jesus in this vision. He doesn't even know who he is. He doesn't even know that he's now looking at the same rabbi that he had been following for years. Jesus has been so transformed by the power and the magnity of, 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 of his eternal nature and everything and, and the symbolism. of John has to be informed of who he is seeing and worshiping. And then along the way, in Revelation chapter 5, uh, well, we, we're, we're introduced to the four living creatures and the 24 elders. Then in John chapter 5, they recognize that there's this seal, there's this book that is sealed. And the information in this book is, is vital and they need to understand it. And in Revelation 5, it says, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? No one in heaven or earth was able to open it. I began to weep because no one was found worthy to open the book. But then one of the elders said to me, don't stop weeping. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has overcome. He's going to open up the seals. And he said, I saw the throne and the elders and a lamb standing as if it had been slain. He is worthy to open the book. John sees a lamb. The lamb is magnified. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped a lamb. This lamb is of such stature, of such significance that the heavenly beings, these four powerful creatures, the 24 elders, as the lamb enters the scene, they fall down from their thrones. They cast their thrones and they worship the lamb. If John had had this vision first and then wrote the Gospel of John, what do you think he's thinking about when John the Baptist says, oh, by the way, behold, the Lamb of God? Do you think John thinks this is a, a small thing? Oh, yeah, that's that you know, symbolic thing. Remember how lambs, they would die and it symbolizes sacrifice. And oh, yeah, now Jesus is doing that. John has this enormous expansive idea of who the lamb is because he's had the revelation vision it goes on to say worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power riches wisdom mighty honor glory blessing 
to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing, honor, glory, dominion forever and ever. Same author, guys. This is John. Behold the lamb of God. The four living creatures kept worshiping, saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Jesus is the Lamb of God, but He's more. He's more than just the little lamb you see in pictures of the very sad story of the lamb with the blood because they slit His neck and, and the, you know, the fire is going. And we thank you, Jesus, for being that for us. But He's not just the lamb who died. He's the lamb who's victorious. He's the lamb that all heaven bows down before. Jesus is more. And when John the Baptist saw Jesus walking on the seashore or walking on the river Jordan, and he said, behold the lamb, he was inviting his disciples saying, look, this is my whole ministry. This is the whole purpose I exist. My whole purpose is to point you to the lamb. And it was not a loss for him for, to have these two disciples follow after. It's exactly what John wanted to happen. It's exactly what Jesus wanted to happen. So here, coming back to John chapter 1 and verse 35 and following, it says that two of the disciples were with him, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Now, we know that one of those disciples is Andrew. He's named later. And by the way, John only names six of the disciples in all of his gospel. The purpose of his gospel is not to enumerate the disciples. He'll mention four of them here, Philip and Nathaniel, Peter and Andrew. Okay, he'll, he'll mention Judas and his betrayal. And then the, uh, the Doubting Thomas episode is also in John. But he never mentions himself. His name never appears in his own gospel. He never mentions James, his brother. He never mentions the other James or Simon the Zealot or Matthew. He never names them because the purpose of his gospel does not depend on that or need that. However, we know that one of these disciples is Andrew. It's almost universally agreed that he, John, the apostle, was the other one. He was probably the other one who also turned and followed Jesus. So he's called the Lamb of God, but John in his his uh, uh, larger understanding is inviting the reader to really delve into the depths of what it means for Jesus to be the lamb. Then he's called the rabbi. That's another term that he's called. That was an honorific title whenever you were um, wanting to uh, learn from someone and, and, and trusted that what they said was um, um, going to be in accordance with the law of God, you would give them the title rabbi. Jesus never sought that title, but um, he did accept that. Um, and it's interesting that John translates it. Did you notice that in John chapter one, verse 38, he says, they said to him, teacher, which, or excuse me, they said to him, rabbi, which translated means teacher. This is the way of John indicating to us that he's not writing to a Jewish audience. Okay. No Jewish audience would need him to translate rabbi, right? They would know what that means. Even in the Greek, they would know what that means. So he's obviously writing to an, uh, an audience that is not as familiar with, um, Hebrew and Old Testament and um, the Jewish culture. But they identify him as a rabbi. Now, again, we, we know that rabbi and, and teacher, they have a, a, means teacher, and we just honored our teachers. By the way, this is Teacher Appreciation Week um, coming up. Um, we did a, a, an honor for our teachers last week because it was also Education Sabbath, but I'll just mention um, it's also a good opportunity for you parents and advocates to do something nice for teachers this week as it's part of uh, Teacher Appreciation Week. But rabbi uh, means something more than we sometimes think of, even more as a teacher. Probably the more appropriate modern-day translation for, for rabbi would be mentor. Mentor. People did not go to schools to learn from rabbis. They lived with their rabbis. They followed their rabbis. That's why the two apostles came in and said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Where are you staying? It was their way of saying, we want to follow you and we want to be with you, and if we're going to be your disciples, we will live with you. Um, there was a saying that, they, that, the, fair, well, that the, uh, the people had back then when it came to following your rabbi. It's kind of weird, but they would say, may the dust of your rabbi cover you. And it was the idea that you should follow your rabbi so closely that when they walked on the dusty roads and kicked up the dust, you would be following in their example, you'd be following in their teaching, so close that their dust would get on you. Again, just a saying. So Jesus was identified as a rabbi. There, he's called the Messiah. And the one whom the prophets had written about, Moses and the others, and, and, and all of the 
uh, uh, meanings of what the anointed one means, and, and we could spend a lot of time on that. But I want to come to these last ones as the chapter comes to a close. Philip finds his, his buddy Nathaniel, and there's so many wonderful things here. There's the coming and going, come and see, and uh, Andrew's the first uh, evangelist. He goes and finds his brother, brings him to Christ. There's beautiful uh, models of how we should be uh, bringing others to Christ as well, and, and there's so many things that can be learned from this. But in this focus of high Christology, I want to look at the story of Nathaniel. Nathaniel is skeptical at first that, you know, Nazareth is a rough place. I don't think any prophet could come from Nazareth. That doesn't make sense to me. But as Nathaniel is coming, Jesus, in his power, identifies some private information about Nathaniel. And he says, uh, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there's no, no deceit. And again, there's lots that could be said about that, but just moving forward. Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? How do you know me? Jesus answered and said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So this is some kind of a, a, a private moment that Philip or that Nathaniel thought had been limited or he didn't understand it, but he sees in this statement of Christ that Jesus has supernatural knowledge, that Jesus has a supernatural ability to see him. And so Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now here, here's where I, I think it's fascinating, and, and I think this is partly why John was inspired to include this. This is a good response, isn't it? it, it isn't this a good response? Isn't this what you would think Jesus would want? Hey, Nathaniel, I'm so glad you're coming to join the team. Uh, well, I'm still thinking about it. You know, what, you know, you need to prove yourself to me. Okay, I know what you did yesterday. I know what you had for dinner. I, I know what you watched on TV before you went to bed. I saw it all. Wow, you truly are the Son of God. You, you, you saw these private moments in my life. I'm just, you know, embellishing a little bit here. Um, so now I know that you are the Son of God you are the king of Israel. Now, you would think that was exactly what Jesus wanted to hear. That was his mission. He was trying to establish himself as the Messiah, the Son of God, he, as the true king of Israel. You would think that's the right response. That's what everyone should see when they, when they interact with Christ, come to that deep believing conviction. He's the Son of God. He's the king. But this is the whole point of John's gospel. He wants us to understand that Jesus is more. He's more. And so Jesus, let's see, I think I put it up on the screen. Yeah. Jesus in his, uh, edgy, you know, teaching way in his obviously divine way interacts with Nathaniel and says this to him, because I said to you that I saw you on, under the fig tree, you believe? you will see greater things than these. And it's almost, uh, I, you know, it's hard to read tone into it, but it almost sounds like uh, Jesus was disappointed, doesn't it? It almost sounds like he's disappointed. And it, it, it catches me off guard at first. I thought Nathaniel said the right thing. I thought this is what needs to happen. You're the son of God. You're, you're the king of Israel. You're the Messiah. You're the Lamb of God. What more do we need? And then Jesus gives the more. You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Here's the idea. Jesus is saying, it's great that you believe because I saw you. But the greater thing is, do you see me? Do you see me? You acknowledge me as the Son of God. You acknowledge me as the Messiah. You acknowledge me as the King of Israel. All those things are true. But there's a greater and deeper and significant reality that we must grow into. As the Son of Man, I am the bridge 
between heaven and earth. It is through me and my ministry that your prayers and your hopes ascend into the heavens and the Lord's response through the angels and the blessings and the Holy Spirit come down through me to you. I am the link. I am the answer to the curse. I am the Redeemer who can stretch out His arms and, and fill the gulf that has separated heaven and earth. It's great that you appreciate that I see you. The question is, but do you see me? Do you see me? It's more. You need to see more. And you need to not be satisfied with just what you get at the beginning. As great as it is to know that God sees you, the greater miracle is to see more of Jesus. Friends, are you seeing more of Jesus in your life every day? Are you growing in your appreciation of the depths of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God? Are you growing in your appreciation of who the Messiah, the anointed one is? Have you made him your teacher, your mentor? Are you covered with the dust of your rabbi because you are following him so closely? Are you paying more attention to the king of Israel or to Joe Biden and Donald Trump? I'm serious. Uh, let the politics happen. Follow your conscience. What will be, will be. But there is a king we serve that is greater than the president of the United States, friends. And there is no need to get caught up in the hysteria and the depression that follows with all the chaos of the political system. Are you understanding that the Son of God came to this earth and became a Son of Man? Is Jesus growing? Is He more to you today than He was yesterday? That is what John is confronting us with. He's more. He's more. He's more love. He's more grace. He's more power. He's more righteousness. He is more. This, some of you have seen this before, but as we close, I want to show this again. It's a well done thing. Um, Dr. Lockridge, 1976, Detroit, Michigan, gives the sermon, That's My King. And he shares a portion that has been put into a neat YouTube video. And Drew is now going to make it. Thank you.
Have you seen that before? Because I thought about trying to pass it off as myself and just doing it. An hour-long sermon, Dr. Lockridge, 1976, Detroit, Michigan. He ended this sermon with a, that's only three minutes. There's a six-minute description of Jesus that he goes through, uh, and it's just beautifully done. I love the part where he says, I wish I could describe him for you. He's more. He's more. Who do you think he is? He's more. And what a joy it is to learn about him and journey with him. Join us as we continue going through the Gospel of John and learning how Jesus is more. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, Lord, that we can uh, grow and appreciate your love and your beauty, your message, your power, your character. Uh, there's just no end to the journey that we are on. Uh, but every step of the way, Father, you build us, you strengthen us, you give us courage and joy, um, and we just long to, to grow and to know more about you. Uh, you have done everything necessary for our hope, our salvation, our redemption. And Lord, we, we really, it's our privilege as well as our responsibility to draw close to you and to find out everything we can about who you are and what you've done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. We'll see you next week.